I would like to welcome Sydney McCleary from IUPUI, who is a member of the Student Learning Committee, who will give an overview of our webinar today and introduce our presenter. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, so again, my name is Sydney McClary. I have another Student Learning Committee member with me today. Hi, my name is David Russell. And uh, so I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Sarah Shopper. Uh, Sarah is an Assistant Professor of College Student Personnel at Western Illinois University. Sarah has worked for 10 years as a practitioner at various institutions in the areas of fraternity and sorority life, student activities, new student programs, commuter affairs, and leadership programs. Sarah frequently presents at professional conferences and consults with colleges and universities regarding transformative learning. So learning outcomes, environmental conditions that promote learning, and how to assess learning. So that is right up our alley today. So Sarah, if you are ready, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Yes, thank you, Sydney and David. I appreciate being here today with all of you and um, hopefully throughout our time together, if you have questions, you'll ask those questions through the prompts that Eric described in the beginning. So to get going, I wanna share with you a little bit about who I am beyond what my introduction just said. Um, so first of all, that's me on the left-hand side of your screen and I work at Western Illinois, go Leatherneck, so that's what's below that. And then over on the right-hand side of your screen are some important things to me. Now, please know that these are not the only important things to me. Um, up top, I'm the kind of person who has a dog that's named Optimus Prime, and this is what my dog looks like. Um, down below, I put some flowers because I really love spring and I like gardening and being outside and I thought what a nice picture to have on a Friday. And then right there in the middle is the graphic cover of Learning Reconsidered 2. And the reason why I put this here is because as you can see in my um, what I have written there, I was a contributing author to Learning Reconsidered 2 and specifically to a chapter with Dr. Susan Comavez on how to write learning outcomes. So if you're looking for an additional resource beyond this webinar about how to write learn student learning outcomes, this is a great resource for you. And it is free, you can find it available and you can see down below on the image all of the associations, including a Kuhoi that helped to make it possible. And so if you need that link, um, contact Glucujo and they can help you, the Glucujo folks, and they can help you find a link to be able to get that. I want to share that with you today so that you can, again, if you have questions, ask them. And I have some, I guess my picture of Optimus Prime and me telling you that I have him as a dog in my life is my way of preparing you for some maybe really cheesy jokes that I have on here. Um, hopefully they'll at least get you to smile on a Friday. Okay, so here's what I hope you will learn today. I would like for you to be able to identify what learning outcomes are needed for residential students at institutions of higher education. Specifically, I want you thinking about your institution, but because you're all over the place, I can't tell you the name of that institution. Um, you should know it, hopefully, um, but that's the context I want you thinking about. And then hopefully I'll be able to help you articulate the, base, the basics of creating learning outcomes for the residential students at your campus. Okay, this graphic here comes directly from the very first Learning Reconsider that came out in 2004. And I put this on the screen to share with you because I want to remind you of how complicated this learning stuff is and how messy it can be. Hopefully what you can see is that the student is at the center of it. And over on the left-hand side, we have three different areas, the social context, academic context, and institutional context. Some of them we can't do anything about, like institutional context. You might be like we are, like I am here in Macomb, in a little bit smaller town. I can't move Western Illinois to a larger city like Chicago. However, there are some things that can be done to make our institution, for example, more accessible. And if I get to serve on those committees, I can speak up about that. Academic context. You might think that just belongs to faculty members, but I'm going to push back on that as a faculty member and say that the academic context um, includes those who are also in student affairs, which you might think that it, that's the social context. But I would say like those two boxes sort of mush together and really are the focus of some of the things that we can impact and influence in a positive way. 
So the student is there at the center and you can see how the arrows go both ways. And ideally, we want to aim for something with them. So over on the right hand side, you see these integrated outcomes. Another way to phrase that is these are the learning outcomes that we want them to achieve. It seems um, helpful to be able to identify what we want those outcomes to be and then to work all the way over on the left hand side in those contexts so that as the student interacts with those contexts hopefully we have the right recipe so that they reach those outcomes over on the right hand side of the screen so for those of you who need a visual example that this I thought might be able to be helpful okay now, I will admit that I have run into folks who have begged me to please make this learning outcome stuff just a fad. Um, please say that it's going away. And I, as someone who has worked um, in higher education my whole entire career, find it astounding that that's being asked for because I don't see learning as something that's scary. At the same time, I also get that sometimes we might need a reminder of why we need to own and embrace our resp responsibility related to learning. And the first step to doing that is understanding why we even need to focus on learning. And for that, specifically learning outcomes would be the first step in that process. So I created, I'm old, so um, I have been alive long enough to know that um, David Letterman, when he was on TV, had a top 10 list of things. He put his in some sort of funny comedic order, mine or not. Mine is not, but I do have 10 reasons why learning outcomes are needed for residential students. Reason number one, holistic student learning. You all might refer to this as co-curricular. Um, again, I would put out there that I think that um, student learning, and we know this from our foundational documents, so the student um, personnel points of view documents, Way back when in the 1930s and 40s, we were saying, hey, we're all about this holistic development is what we called it at the time. That has transformed into what we would today call holistic student learning. You could call it transformative learning. You could call it co-curricular and the curricular. All of these things are getting at the same thing. Basically that the student is a whole person and that they're complicated and that the information is out there and they take it in in all different ways. I put a picture here of what it might look like if I go to one of our nearby state parks in Macomb, Illinois to remind myself of what it looks like on a beautiful sunny day. And also because it helps me to see that this is outside the classroom. Um, and this is the role that we in student affairs have when it comes to the holistic student learning. Student learning outcomes for residential students also reminds us creating them reminds us that we are institutions of higher education. So last night I worked with some first gen students on campus and last night I asked them what would their reasons be for why learning outcomes should be created for a residential students. So anyone who's living on campus. And one of them said this might be obvious but it's an institution of higher education. It should be about learning. And I smiled and wrote it down because it's controversial. And our institution is of higher education about learning, and you're gonna find me to be someone who's saying to you, yes, they are, and we need them to be. So creating these outcomes can be our first step to doing that. The third reason I have is that it helps to have focused competition. So what I mean by this, um, we as institutions of higher education are all in the same field, which is higher education. However, and it's probably becoming increasingly more um, important for us to realize that we're all competing or clear that we're all competing for the same students. And so having learning outcomes allows us, and specific learning outcomes for our residential students, allows us to compete, not just with off-campus, off but also with each other. Here's what you're gonna learn if you choose to live on campus at, in my case, for example, Western Illinois University. They help us to fulfill our mission. So when I get to the second half of this presentation and talk about how to create them, you're gonna see the role of the mission. And I have here, um, this little picture is just more about like when we set a goal about being first in space, we should try to achieve that goal. Now, I know there's some conspiracy theories out there about it. I'm going with the one I was taught, um, which is that we were um, to walk on the moon. We were the first. But 
we should be creating learning outcomes that fulfill the mission, not just of our office, but the mission of our office should be connected to the mission of the institution. So doing this should make it so that we're more relevant and um, we have more that we can provide for people to see why we should exist and why we're important to the student experience. Reason number five, ethical. So one thing you don't know about me is that I am a person who has um, a few disabil disabilities, one of which is a physical disability. And it drives me bonkers when people go and they park in the handicap parking spot and they put on their flashers like they're just going to be back in 10 minutes. Well, that 10 minutes, I might need that spot because it's the only spot I can use to get out of my vehicle and to walk into the building because I only take a certain number of steps a day. And this was the best and easiest ethical example that I could think of, which is why the graphics on the screen. But to translate that over into the residential experience, I sort of think it's unethical to um, have students and encourage them to live on campus without offering to them what we hope they will learn from that experience. So if they're living off campus, they may be get society or the environment around them teaching them whatever it is. I think one of the ways in which students can make choices is to provide them with the information up front. And it seems ethical to me to be able to say, hey, here's what we hope you'll learn. And they might actually choose living on campus because those experiences are beyond um, how many channels you get on cable TV. And those examples, those outcomes are beyond um, having neighbors next door to you. Things that you can get off campus that really we as institutions of higher education are going to have a harder, harder time competing with because when you're off campus, you don't have to evenly distribute resources and things like that. Reason number six. So I think it allows us to provide responsible resource allocation. So when we're making choices about how we would spend our money, um, time, people, if we have learning outcomes that help us to fulfill the mission, then we can think through, okay, does this request for some of these resources connect to how we want to spend our money or how we want to spend our time and if it doesn't it can be a really easy reason to say no to someone maybe it's another office maybe it's a community member in the town surrounding the institution whatever it might be it allows us to have a method um, of doing that so likewise, it provides a foundation and structure. So if you have learning outcomes for your residential students, it's very easy if I'm a hall director to use my RAs and to talk to them and to train them around, I need you to come up with programs that will help fulfill those learning outcomes. So think about what your students might need to learn in order to achieve those learning outcomes. And they can then build some structures on top of that foundation. Similarly, all of what the department does that's connected to the residential experience can be sort of funneled through those learning outcomes to see how they connect. Mapping outcomes in that way can help you as a department or office realize gaps that you might have at your institution related to achieving those outcomes. Okay, reason number eight. Now, again, I probably I said I didn't put these in any particular order. Some of you might be thinking, ugh, assessment. I'm very aware of that. It's really hard to do any kind of assessment if you don't know what you're trying to assess. So learning outcomes, and you'll see when I get to how to create them, provide a structure for you to be able to do some assessment and gather some data so that you can prove your existence or needs why you should be able to get what you are asking the institution for. Accountability. Likewise, assessment kind of connects to accountability. We know that today there are a host of parents and um, businesses, government, all sorts of folks are saying, what the heck is going on over there in, in, in higher education? And collecting this data, so doing that assessment allows us to be held accountable to them so that we can say, look what we're doing. Here's what we want your child or our students to learn. 
And then finally, my number 10 reason is recruitment. And you'll see in this graphic I have up here, I think it's perfect because it captures just the words related to crew. And that caused me to think about um, sort of if I were to think about my crew, I would think about my team. And if I'm thinking about my team, that's those are usually the people who I need to help me move forward. And so these days, I'm not just talking about recruiting students, which yes, I do think learning outcomes help with that. But I think that having learning outcomes for your residential students can actually help you recruit people for your institution because it makes it very clear what you're about and what they will be doing when they come to your institution going forward to fulfill their responsibilities. And it gives them a purpose and a reason to um, go forward with their responsibilities. Okay, so those are the, that's the first half of my presentation, and those are the reasons why we should create student learning outcomes. If you have any questions related to that, please feel free to send them in. Um, I'm gonna transition into how to create them. If you don't get what my graphics are on the screen, um, this is um, for me to say to you now that you're on board, um, let's talk about how we can create them. Okay, first of all, we got to start at the beginning. And yes, when you look at this on the screen, feel free to laugh. It's the recycle sign. I just got it off the internet. Um, however, the recycle sign does not have plan, implement, assess, and improve on it. The recycle sign has other things. Um, and you should recycle. I'm just borrowing it for the, these purposes. And we got to start up there with the planning part. So oftentimes in my practical experience as a student affairs professional, we jump right into the implementation part and we don't pause and ask, our, ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? And you might have already heard in those top 10 reasons that I just shared how that could be important. And that question of why are we doing what we're doing is what gets at the heart of creating learning outcomes. So that's where we're gonna focus on today. So the up top where it says plan. Okay, step number one is to identify an experience. In this case, residential students, I could say it as living on campus, um, all sorts of different ways you might be able to think about that. This could be a whole host of anything. Um, for the case of this webinar, we're gonna have it be residential students. Then, does this experience fit our mission? So remember when I said to you that your mission was going to become very important, here's one of those times in which you need to check that out. Um, perhaps there's a whole list of experiences you could create, and once you just pull out your mission, you realize that you're creating a lot of stuff that is taking away from fulfilling what your mission is. I don't know what you can do with that stuff, um, but you might have a conversation about it, and it might belong better in another office or somewhere else on campus. Um, in this case, it's going to be thinking through, my hope is, is that you're some sort of an office of residence life, so the residential student experience fits your mission. You're unlike, on the right-hand side, I have a cartoon there of cats and dogs, and the cat telling the dog that, face it, you don't, you've not been, let's face it, you and this organization have never been a good fit. Okay, so then, so we have residential students as our experience. Then we need to identify our stakeholders. Who are all of the people involved in the residential student experience? And I mean genuinely write a big old list of these people. Anyone and everyone you can think of. If it's a department, you can just write down the department name. You don't have to go to the tedious task of writing every single individual's name in there. But anyone who you think has a say in the residential experience. After that, Set up times to meet with those people. So you heard Sydney talk a little bit about my background. Um, when you are in charge of new student programs, AKA, which includes orientation, you learn the importance of committees on campus that do work and um, having them be intentional with who's on them. So for the purposes of knowing you all could be on a whole different variety, a wide variety of sized institutions. I'm just going to say one of the ways, if you're at a bigger institution, that you can do this part is by putting an intentional committee together. So you have this list of stakeholders and you think through, okay, what does that mean for me to have a committee where those 
those the people I invite on the committee would go back to those stakeholders and ask questions and then bring them to the committee meeting. If you're on a smaller campus, you actually have an advantage because you can go and ask these questions in person. And I highly, highly encourage you to go and ask them in person as much as possible or to have your staff do that because it helps to build the relationship between your office and these stakeholders that exist. So you might have to do a little bit of explaining if you're asking other folks in your office to go out and ask. And the basic question is, if these people are stakeholders in the residential experience, they probably have some thoughts about what they want residential students to learn. So I have listed here on the screen a bunch of different ways of asking the exact same question. Some people I have learned are very um, unwilling to ask the question learn because they don't know. For example, don't forget to ask the residential students. Um, they don't know if the students will get it, which is an interesting thing because I actually find that students know that when they come to college that they're wanting to learn something or that they should be learning something. That does not get at if they try to get away with not learning things, because of course they always try to do that, but they are aware that they came to college to learn something. So if you don't want to use that word with them, you can just say like, what do you hope to get out of living on campus? And you don't even have to use that language. And I put them on the screen because I encourage people, and you'll see this in the Learning Reconsidered 2 book, to write one idea per sticky note. So you end up with a bunch of sticky notes. Once you have done that and you've gathered all that feedback, or you've had your committee members do that, and then they bring back that feedback, you can start to cluster these sticky notes based on common topics. This is part of the process I find between going and asking the question and then clustering the sticky notes, I find a lot of institutions, people at institutions are surprised by how much all the stakeholders really are aiming for the same things to have students to learn. And my hope is in emphasizing that, that you can hear how that's getting everyone then on board. When you, if you feel heard as a person, then you feel included and you're more willing to do what it takes so that the team can achieve whatever the team needs to achieve. So here I have a picture and they're using a variety of different colors. I've had people who are very specific about different areas get different colors so that they can see if all the areas are crossing over. You can sort of sort out how you would want to organize that on your own. But you put them together in different clusters. So let's just say that one of those clusters is about communication. And there's something in there about um let's see comedians on campus and you're thinking to yourself that doesn't make any sense that more belongs in student activities that's okay um that person was sharing with you all the things that they want wanted students to learn from being on campus students you can take that sticky note and set it aside you don't have to throw it away um but again you're realizing like the rest of what's in this communication bubble matches up to our mission so the rest of this is what we're gonna to use to create a learning outcome. These up other couple sticky notes about comedians on campus, those can be set to the side and maybe at another time in another place, we'll have a chance to get to them or we'll pass them along to our campus, our student activities office or whatever other more appropriate area. But we're not going to shame someone who is a stakeholder who shared what their thoughts were. That's sort of the key, again, because you're trying to build those relationships with people across campus. Once you do that and you have your cluster, you take, you can have multiple clusters and there is no answer to how many learning outcomes. And if one cluster could be two outcomes, you'll have to kind of sort through that or more. So once you do that, I'm gonna teach you um, the ABCD method of creating an outcome. So the first thing is that you need your audience. So you think through who is this for? Residential students in our case. And then you think about the behavior. So what is the active verb that you want learned? There are many, many lists of active verbs out there. Probably one of the most um, commonly known one is Bloom's taxonomy. Although I will share with you that Bloom isn't the only person who created it. Bloom's just the person who gets the credit for it. There are also others that are out there. I know that um, AAC and U has a list. If you just did a Google for active verb lists, you will find a whole host of different things. But this is the action 
that you want the residential students to be able to take. And then the condition. So what is the context? What are the boundaries? So here, the condition would be uh, in their residence, residence life experience on campus, however you wanna flush that out when it comes to that. I say, what is the context and what are the boundaries? Because I think that can help you. Conditions probably one of the parts that is the most challenging to think about how to phrase it, especially if you're presenting it to these outcomes and sharing them with people outside the institution, which I would encourage you to do, because you post them on your website, they, they need to know, are they learning this just by being on campus or is there a specific part of being on campus? So again, like I said, in your case, through the residential experience. And then degree, to what extent or how much needs to be done? So this is sort of the depth of the behavior. And I think you can actually sort of see this in this cartoon. So funny or not, I actually have had a life experience in which I have said to myself that I have dinosaur arms and I feel like I can't stretch them very far. And in saying that, it meant that my ability to reach was limited. So when you think about that active verb, there is a difference between if we want our students to identify something and if we want our students to compare and contrast something. If you go and you find the Bloom's taxonomy, which is a list of active verbs, if you go and find that, you're going to find that it increases from left to right in a lot of the ways it's presented in terms of the challenge that it presents for the students to be able to think through what it takes. Like I said, Asking students to identify something is an active verb, but asking them to compare and contrast is also um, active, and it is a lot harder to do that than it is to identify something. So that's the ABCD method. Now, I'm not going to stop here because, well, first of all, I wouldn't be fulfilling what is in Learning Reconsidered 2, which I want you to know is a resource that's out there for you, but also because I think this is where we bring in what we have learned about learning and how it happens from a whole bunch of interdisciplinary disciplines or inter, well, a whole bunch of different disciplines, which makes it interdisciplinary. And that is incorporating the meaning making structure. So some of you might be thinking on the phone call today, might be thinking back to theory classes that you've had, um, all sorts of things, depending on how long ago that was, it might help you to understand how much you learned about how meaning is made. I would say there's been a movement in the past, well, since the 2000s, and a lot of it has to do with technology because information is more at students' fingertips. We have started to learn. It has also allowed us to learn a little bit more about how the brain, and I genuinely mean the biological brain and our neurons work. And it has made some things that we might think are theoretical actually connected to the biology of how we work. So in the meaning-making structure, thinking through in your outcome, how is it that this outcome is challenging the person who's learning? So in this case, the resident, residential student, how are we asking them to see themselves in relation to an other? And an other here can be a person, but it can also be a thing. And I do have exa an example here at the end for you all to be able to see that. And then another component of that is one's the intrapersonal, which is one's internal beliefs and values. So how is it asking them to figure out what their beliefs and values are? This is not how is it telling them what their internal beliefs and values should be. This is how is it asking them to use what they think they are. So this, the student gets to figure this out on their own. And then the third component is the cognitive. So how is the person making sense of the information being asked in this? And these three things, if you think about it, and you think about a life experience that you've had, you're taking in information in all three of these areas. You just might not call them interpersonal, intrapersonal, and cognitive. You might call them, um, you might refer to them as your different senses. So when I'm even now talking to you all on this webinar, I am thinking about the fact that I'm the presenter and you all are the listeners. 
So that's how I see myself in relation to you. I am thinking about my internal values and beliefs because I 100% believe in transformative learning and and so nerdy about it. I get very excited. And I'm trying to think of how you all might be making sense of the information by providing you a variety of examples that my hope is you can connect to. So through all three of those, I'm trying to connect to you. And you saw me just a moment ago accidentally go forward. I hit the button, I apologize for that. But now we are there. So here we have, you might not have realized this, but at the beginning of the webinar, I shared with you what I wanted you to learn. So I have put it in a learning outcome for you to be able to see. And on your screen are the different colors. So Glacujo webinar participants, that's the audience, will identify, identify as a behavior, why learning outcomes are needed for residential students at institutions of higher education. The identify why learning outcomes is the degree, because that's the depth of identify, and then needed for residential students at institutions of higher education is the condition. This same exact learning outcome, I'm checking one more time to make sure that it connects to the meaning making structure. So here we have the interpersonal, you all, Glucujo webinar participants are going to think about how you will identify why learning outcomes are needed for residential students at institutions of higher education. So you're thinking about these learning outcomes in relation to your institution, this knowledge that you're learning in relation to your institution. And then identify why, that's where your values and beliefs are gonna come in. Again, think about your mission, think about your vision as an office, whatever you call it. I'm not someone who gets really, particular about if your vision is really your mission or not, all that kind of stuff. In fact, I'm actually not someone who says it has to be told, it has to be written as a learning outcome. I'm more someone who says you could call it a goal. It doesn't matter to me what you call it, but it does seem to me that you should have an idea of what you hope students will learn because, again, they're taking in information all the time. So then you would repeat this process for every single one of those clusters of post-it notes that you have until you have your finalized list of learning outcomes. At the institution, eventually, you might be starting to see how you can have learning outcomes at all different levels. So you might start having learning outcomes that your RAs create for their programs, your departments. That's what we're talking about in this webinar, can have learning outcomes. Your institution, Many institutions have learning outcomes. I would encourage you to speak up and initiate if your institution only has learning outcomes for the faculty side of the institution. And I say that because what we know about students, they don't just, just because they walk into the building I teach classes in doesn't mean that they forget everything else about who they are. They bring all of who they are with them wherever they go. And so, if we're wanting as an institution for them to learn something, we should all be working toward that, whatever it is. And then finally, my last slide, which I think is perfect timing, um, is for me to turn it over to David and Sydney and see if you all have any questions about this. I hope that this was very helpful to you all and that it gives you a place to start and maybe it'll lead to future questions or future webinars that you wanna learn more about what to do with those outcomes. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think we have some questions coming in. Um, we'll just kind of wait and see what comes in. Yeah. Maybe nobody has any questions. Um. Oh, sorry, we're trying to read it. It's uh, we're trying to make the box bigger. It's a little small for, to read right now. Oh, you're fine. Take your time. Um, so, uh, the first question: uh, Do you think departmental learning outcomes should change over time, and if so, how often? Ah, that is an excellent question, and. 
I'm going to do the typical student affairs answer and say it depends. Um, I absolutely think they should be revisited. So, and I think they should be revisited every time. So if I'm in charge of residence life, I'm going to revisit them minimally once a year. And that's because as the next school year gears up, are these still of what we want our students to learn about life on campus? And that's a good time to revisit that. It might be that they are, but asking that question actually allows us if something changes in our environment or in our world and we need to move in a different direction with what we want them to learn. It allows for that opportunity before we start to set up everything else throughout the school year in order to achieve those outcomes. So I hope that helps, but it sort of depends. Awesome. Uh, so our next question, what effective assessment strategies have you seen for measuring the depth of learning? <sighs> Great question effective assessment that I have seen for measuring the depth of learning. Well, what I will say for this webinar and these purposes is this, whatever active verb you select, you need to be given a time in which you can achieve that. So in this webinar, I used the active verb identify. And so if I was going to create a tool um, to assess if you have achieved that, I need to give you an opportunity to be able to identify them. And so whatever you want to do, compare and contrast and think as creatively as you want to. There can be everything from a survey, which we're fabulous at in student affairs, it used to be half sheets of paper passed around and it was more about satisfaction, but that's not going to get at the active verb. You need to do something that gets at the active verb. It can be a survey via paper or technology it can be creating a program it could be doing a presentation there's a whole like i think that the beauty of us in student affairs is that we can be as creative as we want to be because we have all these contexts that are outside of the classroom and so we can measure things observation absolutely gets included if there are things that we want residential students to learn about their environment around them and the community around them some of what we can do is ask those who are in our department to keep a running tally of observations related to um, trash in the hall or recycling or and i'm just thinking off the top of my head which is probably not the best but i think that whatever you do you need to do it not only consistently and easily and have it be a part of your practice which you might realize that you're already doing um, but you also need to be able to make sure it gets at whatever that active verb is. Awesome. Um, so our next question, what are your recommendations on assessing learning outcomes that are created through this process? Can you repeat that question one more time? Um, what are your recommendations on assessing learning outcomes that are created through this process? I'm not sure if I hear that question as much different than the one before. Um, I think it's asking about assessment again, and that would be through the active verb that you select. And it's gonna get messy. I'll just put that out there. So you're gonna have this group of people because I don't actually know, besides maybe my own house, of a location where you're not gonna have a group of people come together and have them not to disagree. So they're going to disagree about what verb to pick and where do we start? And is there a difference between upper class housing and um, underclass housing, if that's even a word? Um, so that's, it's gonna get messy, but that's the beauty of it. Because once you clarify what you're really wanting as an office related to your mission, then you can aim to achieve that. Instead of doing what my experience has been, we've been doing in student affairs, which is, it worked for me, so this is what we're going to do. Or it worked last year, so this is what we're going to do. Which is fine. I want you to hear that there's like, we should throw everything out. But we're sort of missing the whole point of why are we doing this and how does this help us to get at what we say we're about. So the say do thing is a little smaller when we pause and ask ourselves to create learning outcomes and actually try to achieve them. It also makes us relevant to faculty. 
So a really easy way to build partnership with faculty, instead of asking me as a faculty member to come into a hall and do a program, for example, asking me if I too would like students to learn about appropriate and respectful communication. I have a hard time knowing any faculty member who would say, no, I don't want that. Now, how I do it and how I help students learn that in my classroom is going to look different than in a residence hall, but we're both aiming for the same goal. Awesome. Uh, so our next question, uh, depending on the size of your campus, would it change the approach taken in identifying learning outcomes? Uh, the asker gives an example. Uh, doing learning outcomes every year seems a bit much for a small private college. Yes. Um, and I would say, besides yes, I agree that it's, so if your institution has no learning outcomes at all, you got to start somewhere. So start with a place where you're going to be able to have the most success. Maybe it's just at your department level because you're a small department and you can easily get together and the three people that I'm making up in my mind now that work in your department can easily get together and can go through the process. By the director of that office or the person in charge of that office taking it to the VP, you might get the VP to realize, hey, Maybe we need learning outcomes for our whole entire campus. And so it might start to expand from there. You might then need to, so the next year you, you sit on a committee where you're expanding learning outcomes, but instead of thinking about them just for the residential students, now you're thinking about them for the whole campus. And then a year after that, maybe you go back and visit just for residential students. Um, I think you're gonna have to be strategic and I don't think it's a problem to actually say the timeline that is realistic for us to be able to work on these is every three years. And to I would advertise it and put it out there. I think the more transparent that we are, the more we are actually showing people what we want them to learn. And that goes back to my recruitment slide that I had. I think people will want to come because it's very clear what you're about and it's clear what they're going to get. It actually can make a lot of other offices very um, focused as well. So I'm thinking judicial stuff that happens in residence life. It can be very easy to to say, well, here's what we wanted you to learn. Here's how we've shared this with you. And you went and did this. So help me understand that. Um, it can create sort of that foundation or structure. But I think putting it out there and that some of that conversation is just going to be realistic with yourself as well as talk to the staff in your office. And maybe I've worked at a variety of institutions. When I was at a small, much smaller institution and I was the director of new student programs, we had directors meetings once a month. And so that could have been a place where I brought it up and said, how do we want to approach this? And then we as a team of directors would have decided how to sort of navigate through. Do we want to try out one office? Do we want to start out as a division? What do we want that to look like? Awesome. Um, so our next question, what would be your suggested reading list for those looking to learn more about this topic? Mm -hmm. Well, that is an excellent question. So besides Learning Reconsidered 2 and you which will make reference to Learning Reconsidered 1, if you have not read those documents, I encourage you to do that. I also will point out that they are available for free. So that's a helpful thing and I always try to keep cost in mind. There is an excellent book by James Zoll, who wrote a book called The Art of Changing the Brain. And it talks about why all of this is very important and provides a variety of different strategies for incorporating learning into your practice. Now, I ask people to read this, my students to read this, and I encourage them to just, instead of reading teacher, or instructor to just transform it in their mind and read it as student affairs professional. And it's this aha moment. He is a biologist or neurologist, maybe both. And he took all of what's out there in research and wrote it in this very easy to access understanding manner and really makes a good argument for why we should move in this direction. The other resources I have and that I know about are um, Peggy Mackey, 
is a is an author who writes a lot in this area that's worth looking up and that's m-a-k-i and she looks at across all institutions learning outcomes at that level but she has a lot of excellent resources out there about it so i would say because i don't want to overwhelm everyone i would say those two are really great places to start i also think that their associations have been moving in this direction for about 20 years now or more arguably i would say student affairs is, has has since its inception because we've talked about holistic um, development but i would say that look at what they've published and put out there because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel and use this webinar as a resource there's nothing that says you can't re-listen to it stop it slow it down so that it makes it sound like i'm talking whale um do whatever you would like um, with it but it can you can use it to create worksheets templates things like that okay so our next question are there any strategies that you have found successful in teaching this concept to undergraduate students especially when incorporating the pieces around making meaning or around meaning making and student development theory yeah, actually, um, that's a great question. I have found out of all the people who it's the easiest to get on board, I have found undergraduate students the easiest to get on board because you can ask them what it is that they hope to get out of something and they can tell you. And then I have found that's part of the reason why I provided the definitions related to the different dimensions of the meaning making structure. I have found that using those definitions is more helpful than and having them think of an experience. So I'll, I'll give away this activity that I do. So I will ask people to think of learning, the kind of learning that sticks with you. And when you think of that, I want you to think not of what you learned, but of how you learned it. And have them identify, do a little bit of reflection for a moment. It doesn't matter to me what it is, but how did you learn it? And then as they share how they learned it, I then help them to see the connection between the meaning making structure and how they learned it in that moment. And that has been very powerful and especially the how one sees oneself in relation to others, as well as one's internal beliefs. Well, all of them, I really shouldn't favor any of them. All three of the dimensions become really powerful and they will share with you honestly what was going on in their mind. Did they even question the information they were taking in or did they just accept it as fact? How did they, if they saw themselves in relation to others, did their beliefs become those other people's beliefs? For example, if they went out and they got in trouble for, I don't know, being completely uh intoxicated on the weekend did they come back and as they're thinking about that experience by presenting to them what those dimensions are they might say well i was valuing making friends and how i did that was these people were cool so i saw myself as not cool so i decided that their definition of cool would become my definition of cool and it's very powerful the conversations you can have with them that are honest and open about them awesome um those are the questions i have right now so i don't know if there are going to be more that are going to be coming in or not sure yeah david and sarah um thank you i think we'll uh wind down the webinar now um, those are all the questions that have come in, but if you do have additional questions, um, Dr. Dr. Shopper might be willing to share her email address or a way to contact her if there's any follow-ups. Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And I can share that right now. My email is S E. So Sarah, and then E is for Elizabeth dash S C H O P E R. So my last name at W I U. Edu. And I'm okay if Sydney or Eric or David, if someone wants to type that up and put it somewhere so that they can see how to contact me, because I'm fine with that. Sure. I will actually type that up right now and send that uh, to the audience right now. 
I love this stuff. I think it's important. I think it justifies our existence, which sounds very um, powerful um, in my work, in my mind. And I am totally willing to help out. So if you have more questions or you get into that messy place and you don't quite know the next step, whether it's now or a few months from now or even maybe next year, I'm very open to being a consultant and working with you. Fantastic. A special thank you to Dr. Sh Dr. Shopper uh, for her time today. Uh, another thank you to um, David and Sydney from the Student Learning Committee for helping moderate the session today and for the Student Learning Committee for sponsoring this wonderful webinar. Um, we had such great involvement today and I think this is such a great relevant topic. We did have a question come in um, about whether or not this would be available as a recording, yes. Um, you will be able to find this later this afternoon on the Glucuho website. If you go to glucuho.org and then click on the resources heading and under there you'll find webinar archives. You'll be able to see the recording of this webinar on the website this afternoon. So again, thank you everybody for attending. Um, have a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you all.